Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for um, attending and registering to, to, to view this webinar. My name is Lisa Moore, and I head up the Maritime Division of FrontM, a communication and collaboration AI software technology business into the maritime sector. Um, today's webinar, we're going to focus on suicide and depression in seafarers during a pandemic. Um, and we've invited along some leading pa industry panel of experts we're going to talk to you about the three-step strategy to saving seafarers and improving mental health at sea. Before we get started, I'd just like to introduce you to our panel. We have uh, Peter Hult from Vicand, who's the CEO and president. Um, Vicand are a global uh, uh, maritime medical solutions provider. We have Caitlin Vaughan, project manager from ESWAN, the International Seafarers Welfare and Assistance Network. We'll also be hearing from Martin, Marine Profile um, from Martin Hedman, who is a maritime clinical psychologist. Um, and Marine Profile focused primarily on consultancy, psychology consultancy into the maritime sector. And then we'll be hearing today from Mark Warner, who's the marketing and PR director for Inmarsat, one of the world's largest uh, satellite and telecommunications providers. Now, from today's uh, webinar, um, what you will be, what what you will, the key takeaways that you'll be looking to get from the session today will be how to identify seafarers at risk and what support frameworks are available to engage with seafarers. We'll also be looking at how to leverage mental health tools and technologies that are currently available. Now, at, at the end of the session today, um, at the end of each speaker session today, there will be an opportunity to drop any questions you have in the chat box. And we'll try to answer as many as we possibly can. If we don't answer all questions today, we will be sending out a follow-up email with a short survey, which will also include links to the various tools and resources that the panel will be sharing with you. And at which point, any outstanding questions, we will try to address them in that email. Now, life as we know it is notoriously difficult um, as, for seafarers, let alone during a pandemic. Some of the key issues that they face on a day-to-day -day basis include isolation and working away from their loved ones for such a long time that creates a number of mental health and emotional challenges. They, they do long hours leading to extreme fatigue, which can also present safety issues. So they work in some of the harshest, most isolated conditions, um, which again present a, a number of physical and, and mental health issues. And then more often than not, sometimes whilst at sea, um, they can't often be poor conditions where they have limited resources and supplies, which can lead to low self-esteem and self-worth. And then there is the never ending, even in the 21st century, we're still dealing with piracy, um, which is never ending and poses an immediate threat to lives and physical well-being. Now, Peter, just out of curiosity, it would be really interesting to hear what your views are um, an experience of the current healthcare situation across the maritime industry. Well, thank you, Lisa, and thank you um, for hosting this webinar today, and, and good morning to all of you, or good afternoon to some of you. Um, just a little quick background here as well, that Vican, as a global maritime healthcare provider, is constantly involved with and impacted by the mental wellness challenges that we all face in the maritime industry. Um, as many of you on this webinar um, recognize having worked on board, our environments differ greatly to the so-called normal world where someone can go to work, go home after work and readily be able to seek help from their local medical and mental health practitioner when needed. Our life on board is all consuming. Our seafarers work long hours, sometimes in very difficult and challenging environments over extended periods of time. They live their lives on board. They create friendships and in some instances, almost family relationships. That is the bond that seafarers what makes the maritime world very different. Our medical team, doctors and nurses, all have worked on board. They know the environment, they have created the friendships and they have a bond with our seafarers. This is also the reason for our passion to help and support our maritime colleagues and friends, especially during this time of real challenges with crew not being able to go home because of the crew change disruptions that we see around the world. We feel for our seafaring colleagues for not being able to see their families and being in constant fear of getting infected by coronavirus. 
We unfortunately are being involved with mental wellness challenges and suicides on a much too frequent basis, sometimes several times a week. And having to deal with the lasting results, not only for the crew members' family at home, but also their family and friends on board ship. And in many cases, this could have been avoided. In one very sad instance, one of our close colleagues on a ship endured real mental wellness stress and doubts in himself. In any normal circumstance, he would have been able to disembark and connect with a shoreside mental wellness practitioner in his home country, but for COVID-19. Instead, he was forced to remain on board for many more weeks, although he was provided persistent mental wellness support and coaching during this period of time. And for a brief moment, just before he was finally due to disembark, he appeared to improve quite substantially. We all thought with his imminent departure date firm and scheduled to go home, he was in a stable frame of mind. Unfortunately, just days before his sign off date, he committed suicide. As it turns out, his peaceful demeanor was a sign of him resolving himself to the difficult decision that he had reached. He was a friend and a colleague, and in many ways, a family member of many. His passing impacted us all deeply. Unfortunately, this is one of many stories that should not be needed to be told. Um, I think with today's um, conversation, um, we're really grateful that we have this conversation. It is, it's, it, out of all of the conversations in the maritime industry, this is the most important discussion to be had. It's about people, it's about the life, it's about their death. And I'm grateful to be here with all of you guys because today we're gonna to talk about ways to resolve this situation. So Lisa, back over to you. Thank you so much, Peter. And, and thank you for sharing um, that loss with the audience. Sadly, um, this is just one of many tragic cases that we hear about on a day-to-day -day basis that could have been avoided. Um, in terms of how do you, I mean, in terms of avoidance, um, how do you believe the maritime industry can begin to understand what's at stake um, and, and what lessons can be learned from the past to help address similar situations going forward? I lost you there for a second. Uh, sorry, Peter, apologies. How do you believe that the maritime industry can begin to understand what's at stake and learn from the, the past efforts to address similar situations in the future? to help preserve lives at sea? Well, to be honest with you, I think that everyone knows about the challenge. I think uh, this, is, this is a challenge that everyone has recognized to be a major concern in the maritime industry, especially with the COVID-19 uh, crisis and the difficulties having crew members disembarked. I think it's just a matter of the fact that everyone needs to recognize that a structured support system needs to be provided to provide the healthcare support, the mental wellness support to our seafarers around the world. I think the recognition is there. I think the willingness is there. I think the tools are there. It's just a matter of getting together and to be able to provide this solution in a very easy and accessible way. In terms of, so I would say, I would agree with you. And I think there's a, there's a question mark around the level of commitment, because as you say, the tools are there, they're readily accessible. Um, but I think it's a question of the, the commitment from the industry to come together to, 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 to make these available. Um, in terms of um, MICAN's um, work that you're doing from a mental health and care perspective, um, how do you plan to expand upon your existing programs um, and care efforts uh, in the future to address these issues and, and, and how? And what, so, what sort of initiatives are you currently working on? Well, thank you for that. And, and... VCAN is a, a global maritime total healthcare solutions provider, um, and with this commitment to the maritime industry, we have created a custom-built maritime uh, wellness program called MAP, Marine, yep. Marine Industry uh, Assistance Program. Uh, is that something you want me to talk about now, Lisa, or...? No, I think maybe, I think let's say map, because I think it would be really useful actually now that we're talking about more about the tools to, to, to have a chat with Caitlin. Um, so thank you very much for that, Peter. We will come back to map. Um, Caitlin, um, this one is a membership organisation that's heavily involved in promoting um, and supporting the welfare of seafarers all over the world. It would be really good if you could tell us a bit more about the type of work that this one's involved in. Sure. Th thanks, Lisa. Um, 
Yeah, Eyes One is a um, a charity which promotes the welfare and well-being of seafarers all over the world. Uh, we run a number of projects and programs, um, and our, our main operation is a free 24-hour multilingual helpline um, called Seafar Help, which um, provides seafarers and their families with emotional support and practical guidance. Uh, we work closely also with our regional teams in uh, the Philippines, Nigeria and, and, and India as well, um, which provides seafarers with face-to-face -face support and, and region-specific initiatives. Uh, you can imagine that both teams, the, the helpline and the regional teams have been extremely busy um, over the past five months in particular, um, assisting seafarers that have been negatively affected by the um, COVID-19 situation and that I mean, has been di every issue there has been really directly related to to mental health, and has has we've seen many seafarers seriously affected. Uh, do you want me to talk a bit more about that now, or did you have another question you wanted me to answer? Yeah, I do have some questions around, but I think it I think it would be interesting. So you said that obviously the health plan's been very busy, extremely busy over the past five months. Um, I, I suspect that's in, in relation to the, the pandemic um, that the, the industry has been facing and the humanitarian crisis. How have um, ISA actually been supporting seafarers affected by seafarers and their families affected by the pandemic? And what has your experience been of this so far? Well, I think, I mean, just to mention that um, all year round when we're supporting seafarers, um, we see a, a lot of issues that negatively affect seafarers and, and have an impact on their mental health. So we may refer or we refer a lot of issues, employment issues, contractual issues and financial worries. Uh, we refer those on to other agencies, such as the ITF. Um, but generally, those seafarers will also need um, a certain level of emotional support, even if that's not what their necessary calling is about in the, be in the beginning. You know, we see um, a negative impact on mental health from issues stemming from there being small crew numbers and seafarers feeling isolated and um, issues around fatigue and long voyages and bullying and harassment and um, those sorts of things but I mean it's also true to say that seafarers like anyone else um, really are uh, can be at risk of mental health issues and, and the, they may have the, the best employer they may love their job um, but the, the truth is they, that they're still uh, likelihood of experiencing those issues and that their the access to support is always going to be more challenging on board. Um, when we're looking at the last five months and um, particularly relating to COVID-19, um, we all know that extended time on board and the other worries about the uncertainty surrounding the pandemic, um, worries about health and family health, difficulties getting home, um, the quarantine on board, we're still seeing that as an issue, uh, well, seafarers quarantine and, and social distancing on board, causing further isolation than you know we would usually see. And then the big issue being about job losses and financial worries for those seafarers that haven't been able to join vessels. Um, so they've, they've all really obviously impacted very negatively on, on seafarers' mental health. Um, and I, I think what's interesting here is, I mean, just to say, before I go on and talk a little bit more detail about the actual cases we've been dealing with, we've seen a threefold increase in cases compared with, with last year. Um, and at its peak, we we dealt with over 2,000 communications from seafarers and their families um, just in one month. And we've seen uh, well over near, well over 8,000 um, COVID-19 related cases in um, the last five months. Um, The, are, sorry, sorry. Can, no, I was just about to say, um, Caitlin, those are staggering um, numbers that you're quoting there in terms of the, the, the level of increase that you've seen um, and, and the number of cases um, just this, this past year and specifically the past five months when you compare it to the same time last year. I think that helps to put things into perspective. So thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, I think just what's on screen now is um, the the top sort of five related COVID nineteen problems that have been that seafarers and their families have been reporting to us. Um, 
in lots of ways they don't they don't differ to the sorts of cases that we usually see but the, there are a few kind of interesting things to note here um we see um financial issues and contractual issues are usually top um and they're usually the the main reasons why seafarers are contacting us and as i said before those always have a negative impact on on how seafarers how anyone's feeling when we have these financial worries that may be very serious um but what's most significant here is that for the first time ever um psychological issues and seafarers directly reporting stress and anxiety um have factored into the top five issues so while seafarers will there'll be an element of um of distress most of the time when a seafarer contacts us that's not why they're contacting us they're contacting us for a very practical issue that needs a practical solution yeah. um, and hopefully a lot of the time those practical solutions help to alleviate the stress yeah. but this time we're seeing seafarers contacting us um, especially in the beginning when there was such uncertainty about the, having heard nothing about what would, was happening back home in their countries worrying about their own health um, and been being and reporting just saying how low they were feeling and how low they felt the rest of their crew were feeling and still are to be honest um it's interesting to say that um i've got some questions coming from the audience um and i do have a question for yourself as well but i'd like to address the audience one first of all so caitlin do you think seafarers who have been at sea for a long period of time should be fast-tracked um at ports and immigration some port authorities as i'm sure you're well aware require additional isolation before repatriation. What's your thoughts on that? I mean, it's difficult to ever um, make a blanket statement, but I mean, I, um, absolutely, seafarers should be prioritised. Um, and I mean, it's just such a pity that it has taken so many efforts even to get as far as we have. And I think, I think the industry has um, come together in so many positive ways to get governments to recognise seafarers as key workers and it's just really, really important that those um get involved in that really and that seafarers um are fast tracked where they can be. There are obvious individual complications and you know that the health it's it's understandable that the health um status of individual countries is a massive worry, but a lot of the time it looks like seafarers have been unfairly impacted as they usually are um, and sometimes blamed um, very unfairly for the for the pandemic in the first place. No, I hear what you're saying. Um, <laughs> thank you very much for that. Um, I hope that answered the question for the audience. Um, so, I mean, psychological stress, so psychological issues such as stress and anxiety making it into the top five, I think that just helps to, to show how much the pandemic has effectively exacerbated the existing situation that seafarers live with on a day to day basis. In your opinion, what do you believe ministries and companies can learn from the challenges that the pandemic has caused? What lessons are there to be learned from this to ensure that if a pandemic was to ever happen again, that seafarers uh, don't encounter the, this, the similar situation that they have the past five months? Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 just before I answer that, I, just to quickly say that as well as um, the helpline, um, ISWAN and, and all of the other maritime charities, particularly the port-based um, welfare charities, um, such as Mission to Seafarers and Sailor Society and Stella Maris, um, all have a number of resources to help support seafarers um, responsibly, responsibly, but they're, they're, all charities work with companies as well um, to try and find preventative methods and make sure that companies are better prepared for um, situations like this. Okay. Um, so that's one, one way, um, I, I think, um, and I'll, I'll come to that in a sec. Um, and I just to say as well that in terms of um, what some of the really important practical support that's out there at the moment from ISWAN and the other charities um, supported by um, like the uh, big funding bodies such as um, ITF Seafarers Trust and TK Foundation and Seafarers UK, there are a number of emergency funds for seafarers and their families who find themselves in um, these complex situations um but in terms of the future i think in some ways it's it's really early to be talking about it because you know we're, we're still within ice and we're still seeing a number of, of very real um current existing issues yeah. um but like i said before you know recognition of cfro as a central role and the continued efforts of the industry 
um, and highlighting that to governments is really important. I think um, there has been some really positive responses from companies who have preempted the challenges, the issues caused by the crew change challenges and extended stays on on um, board. You know, I've, we've been contacted by a number of responsible companies who've been really concerned about their seafarers and while they're doing everything they can to get them home, have been worried about what happens in the meantime. Um, I think that that's really great, but I think there's also a big learning point here that companies can be better prepared and it's really now is the time to be focusing on their own mental health strategies and, and policies and ensuring that there's there's real kind of risk mitigation there and that there's been due consideration towards the support that's available to their seafarers um, all the time, even without these crises. Um, and, you know, to, to work as, as much as possible with with the experts, I think there's a tendency with, with mental health for some reason for um companies probably shore-based companies as well not to consult with mental health professionals as much as they should when yeah. there are other areas of health where they would never deem themselves knowledgeable enough to do that so i, I think talking to experts is really important um they're really importantly there needs to be continued efforts to increase connectivity on board ships that's just invaluable and i know that mark will talk more about that later and then finally, I'll just say that, you know, the importance of positive relationships and interactions on board is is really essential for good mental well-being. And that that there needs to be due attention to that as well um, on making sure that um, people have a good social life on board and can um, interact positively with each other all of the time, but also to try and um, protect against vulnerable groups to isolation, you know, that if there's a woman working alone on board, we see that a lot, that she may be particularly vulnerable to isolation um, and not feeling like she doesn't fit in. And that can happen for other groups as well that may be more vulnerable to isolation. So all of these things need um, proper consideration and from real strong leadership positions. Thank you for that, Caitlin. Um, I think it would be great. I think it's really it's quite it's quite good to hear that you feel that um, it, it needs strong leadership within an organisation to ensure that the the correct checks and balances and procedures and policies are put in place and as you say this is not just about during the pandemic it's pre and post pandemic as well because this is not going away and i think it is a case of what more can be done but it's great to hear that there are some great companies out there who are very forward thinking um, and they've put in place um various strategies and initiatives to support their workers but it does sound like there's still a great deal still to be done there's a lot of educating still to be done um, especially, as you say, if you've got women or anyone on a, on a vessel that feels quite isolated um, and the importance of having positive relations um, in, in, in your working environment um, and beyond. Um, and then to actually have the, the correct experts to provide the, the, the help and the guidance and support that, that the seafarers need. Um, which brings me to Martin. So, Martin, um, in your experience, um, having worked as a clinical psychologist within the maritime industry and, and, and knowing what we do about the, the number of the high number of um, seafarers who suffer from severe depression um, and I think the st latest stats say around about six percent of deaths are due, in, uh, are due to suicide within the maritime industry it would be great to hear what your views are on the existing strategies and tools and resources that have been put in place by the industry um in in line with uh, keeping in line with what caitlin's saying around about the there is a support out there but it would be good to understand your view on perhaps why this has not been uh, embraced so widely across the industry and, and 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 what your thoughts are on this well uh, <clears throat> thank you lisa well uh, the short answer maybe to to what can be done to see to to work towards a reduction in 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 all of this is that what we talked about in the beginning to globally get together in all of this and collaborate more proactively on a long-term plan yeah. uh, but but i mean there are things that we can actually do uh, or companies can do themselves already you know as an immediate response today to the COVID situation but also in terms of a long-term strategy themselves okay. and the, the challenge is uh, the challenge today from a psychological point of view is to tackle the extreme isolation and, and loss of control that is the reality for seafarers, not, not only during normal operations, but of course, even more so now during the pandemic. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the isolation, it speaks for itself. And I think that Caitlin touched on that as well. 
but the loss of control through uncertainty which this pandemic brought with it will you know eventually lead to the loss of hope for any person really and and given given time this increases the risk exponentially for problems like suicide so as an immediate response from from company point of view they really need to make make available for seafarers support so that they can reach out to someone in time of need uh, and you know keeping or containing negative thoughts or problems for yourself on a longer period uh, for a longer period of time it will lower the morale it will have a severe impact of, uh, uh, of well-being so having a 24 7 accessibility to a listening ear is, is a fairly simple yet effective tool or intervention for companies to have in place already actually okay um what's in in, in terms of uh the type of um services and solutions that are currently in place um leadership is something that um caitlin touched upon um and it, it strikes me that it's a crucial part of a proactive approach to to um helping to to provide uh crew welfare support beyond just mental health um how important is this in recognizing crew welfare um, issues on board to, to to have that 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 proactive approach from the leadership team yeah well uh just looking at the proactive strategy i think that is something that is a little bit missing and not taken seriously today not okay. in this particular area uh, but but we do need to be more realistic about it to look at it in a more long term long term perspective because uh, we cannot complex problems like mental health issues cannot be solved with simple like one time interventions. So okay. so in order to reduce mental health issues, the the industry as a whole, as I said before, uh, but also companies need to to commit to, to this and and apply a more proactive strategy dealing with crew welfare. Uh, it you know it, it's very common to see how specific companies put in place intervention after a crisis or problem occurs you know such as offering counseling or or to affected seafarers or who are depressed and maybe trainings of har uh, harassment or stress management for concerned individuals but and of course these are great interventions per se but having a knowledge and understanding in advance it makes us more resilient to mental illness and it also makes us better to or make us better prepared to deal with any kind of psychological crisis that that will occur i mean it's for the same reason that we do the drills and trainings on board the ship to be prepared if something happens and and but also to mitigate safety issues in the long perspective so i mean this is a relevant parallel in in that sense no absolutely and i think the key word there is mitigation um it's not just about mitigating safety issues it's also just mitigating against any mental health issues and as you say i think Mitigation and proactive, being proactive is, is paramount, I think, to, to, to improving the overall quality of seafarers um, from a crew welfare perspective. Um, a question is actually coming from the audience. I'm just going to read that back to you. Um, so, in your opinion, are autonomous ships a healthy working environment for seafarers? We are yet to come across a proper HR regime at any company. What tools do you suggest to have a more human element to the connection between ourselves and the company. Okay, so uh, I was about, or we're thinking a little bit about um, listing some of specific tools that are available for the for the on the market and also available for the industry as a whole, and maybe that will cover that uh, question as well. Uh, if yep. that is okay. Yeah, that sounds perfect. Thank you. Uh, because, I mean. Um, it is, th this is a very important question it's about uh, what tools are available or what can be done that, you know, the more proactive approach. And yeah. the reason for that is that many companies, they, don't, they have not implemented this strategy, not just because of uh, economy, but uh -huh. also lack of general knowledge of mental health issues. And especially what kind of help is out there? What, what can be done? And if you don't know that, then you won't try to, to, to uh, find that help uh, actively maybe it's too much maybe you don't know if it's if it's industry specific specific so if i can give you just an overview yeah uh, on the slide here uh, about what specific tools there are actually out there being used already um, as i mentioned the knowledge for the psychological field in the maritime industry is pretty low uh, the main focus is still on the direct operations with a rational approach to problems uh, however, approaching and understanding emotions and behaviors based on feelings is, is part of the everyday work. Uh, in terms of conflicts we call, uh, with colleagues, 
uh, everyday communication with colleagues and departments, yeah. uh, motivation for work, well-being, you know, just to mention a few. Uh, when any sort of crisis occurs, the psychological element and perspective becomes even more important, actually. But we still see the strategy uh, which focuses on hard values and practical problem solving, uh, such as trying to implement new regulations, new routines, policies, and so forth, um, in, in order to try to uh, avoid or mitigate the, the issue in the future. So one of the first strategical steps in implementing tools is to raise the awareness. Yeah. Uh, the awareness about what impact crew welfare issues have on operations, but also on return on uh, investment and work efficiency, actually. So for this, training sessions in the mental awareness. This can be quite, um, you know, uh, there can be many types of awareness training, but maybe with specific topics, could be depression, suicide prevention, stress harassments, and so forth. Um, and I mean, this is the, pur the purpose of this is to help uh, companies and the industry as a whole to identify, to take it seriously and to understand what seafarers are going through and how to approach that when they actually see it. You can't solve or, or approach anything you don't understand. So from that perspective, the awareness part is crucial in, in, a, in a more proactive uh, strategy. We also have uh, consultations of expert, experts in the field, in the psychological field, for instance, to help set up with strategical implementations of crisis plans or other programs in the in the company or maybe on board the ships as well. Uh, if something happened, then they have a better readiness for that. Yeah. But one very important part is the next one where um, where we also have monitoring of crew member health. Okay. Um, this is something that we already do for the physical health, you know, and if you take, for instance, Conwell corporations who for the past five years have been conducting continuous psychological evaluations of all their officers in the fleet, as an addition to the medical checkups, uh, they have key personnel meet with a medical doctor and then with a psychologist every two years for a checkup. And the purpose here is to monitor and to detect any mental distress and provide early support or intervention if there's needed. So that that really acts as a mitigating uh, uh, aspect here. Martin, a quick question: yep. um, When you say they, they carry out these um, meta, the, the psychological evaluations every two years, in your professional opinion, do you feel perhaps that they should be carried out more frequently than every two years, given given the, that we know how harsh the the environment is whilst at sea? Perhaps on an annual basis, do you think that would be more prevalent, um, and perhaps we'd see um, better results from a, a crew welfare perspective? Maybe the the depression and suicide rates would start to drop if these companies were to review more at, on an annual basis. Well, uh, it's always a balance, of course, with reality, and and of, it comes with a cost and time. Uh, to do these things, but uh, of course, in an ideal world, to follow as closely as possible to monitor the health. I mean, that would be that would be great, and of course, it would mitigate the, any issues coming up. But two years is 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 a limit they set just because it's more reasonable from a practical point of view, economical, yeah. but also try to balance that with outcome. So, but but yes, of course, tighter um, checkouts would be uh, have a greater effect, of course. Okay, thank you for that. Um, we've actually got some questions coming in from the audience. I know that we've obviously got a few more of the tools that we need to go through, um, but these are quite interesting questions. So the first one is, is there an issue of mistrust involved uh, with companies providing access to 24-7 helplines, especially when the hotline is provided by the company and not by a third party? Seafarers may be worried about confidentiality and losing their jobs. How, how do you deal with this? And I am aware that this is also um, a challenge that Iswan and Caitlin deal with on a day-to-day -day basis too, but how, how do how would you deal with this? Yeah, I, um, this is a question maybe that also Caitlin or Peter would uh, be able to step in to answer, but, but, but I know that this is, a, of course, a sensitive issue about confidentiality and, and the sensitivity about all of this. It becomes a, bit, a little bit about political matter at times. Yeah. Um, and, and that, of course, is a problem, but make it available is part of the strategy to also uh, remove the, uh, the stigma around all of this. Uh, so it becomes more normal to, to uh, make these sort of contacts, implement these quarter hotlines and, and so forth. But 
Yeah, it, it, it is easier. Maybe maybe Caitlin or, or Peter has some comments also on that. Caitlin, well, I'm, I know that this is something that you and I have discussed in, in great detail, so it'd be great to hear your thoughts on it. Well, yeah, I mean, confidentiality is a major issue for seafarers. Job security um, is so tied up with that. So um, there are loads of barriers to accessing support, particularly mental health support, because of the stigma attached to it. Um, and people just, uh, seafarers um, and people in general, often just don't even consider it as an option. So there are definite um, issues with company provided helplines in this respect, because there's seemingly sometimes are added um barrier it's not a reason to not provide them because there are ways of ways around that but i think that we're constantly trying to chip away at the, the stigma and uh, you know there's an argument that the, um that's part of the reason for mental health awareness training is you know a big advantage to that is the hope that if you can help um um improve people's understanding of mental health, then you can um, also help to reduce stigma in that way. Uh, we do provide external helplines, uh, emotional support helplines for some companies, and we work with them to find ways around the issues around trust. But ultimately, that there has to be work within a company to try and ensure that their seafarers have um, really have faith in, in the fact that the, these lines are confidential and that they're not going to be used against them in any way and um, that's a company culture thing um but you know that there are other issues there and there are other positives like for example if a, a lot of uh, people feel straight away that they have um i suppose more faith in their company if those sorts of services are provided and that can help to break down some of those barriers just providing them in the first place but yeah it's a definite area of concern and we see it on our own independent helpline all of the time. Yeah, thank you for that, Caitlin. Um, yeah. As well, may I? Yeah, please, Peter, thank you. So, so from our perspective, um, it's very clear. We There is confidentiality um, by ethical standards and legal standards. So yeah. There is yeah. no way that we can share any details that is communicated between us and the crew member. It is totally confidential and will never be shared with the corporation ever. And, and that's a line we will never step over. The only time we would ever communicate with a company about a mental health issue is if, it, if there is an immediate need, if there's immediate danger to another person, to the person or to the vessel. But it has to be immediate, immediate, not tomorrow, immediate. There's a very clear a standard of what you can share and not share and for the most part you cannot share anything and we will never step over that line no that makes perfect sense i think um i think where, where there is a, a crisis um then yeah it makes sense that there would there, there comes a point where you would have to, to 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 share because it's about saving a life but outside of that yeah confident patient confident confidentiality is obviously paramount um so thank you for that um martin yes back to the tools it'd be great to hear a bit more about the tools that are available um in terms of from an onboard management perspective um and also for um on board for crew too i mean one aspect just to remind a little bit is the uh, the leadership aspect of this and i know that this has been discussed more and more now in previous webinars and seminars on on, on topics of mental health and we have come to understand that how crucial leadership is and what impact bad, especially leadership, has on crew welfare. Yeah. Um, so we especially know now that that people management, for instance, uh, is uh, uh, something that is crucial for team motivation, uh, both ashore and on board the vessels, and to deal with crisis probably. Uh -huh. And more and more emphasis is put on this when doing psychological assessments, uh, which is conducted prior to promotions or hire of new seafarers or or office personnel, and the, and of course this is something I could talk for hours about. But but I would leave it with the with the notion here that um, psychological assessment as a service through through psychometric tests or meeting with the maritime psychology it has been around for decades, uh, and act it acts as a cornerstone here for the proactive strategy uh, to mitigate safety and mental issues, and and this there is where it bridges over to the onboard management tools. Because as you can see here, there are many that are the same. The mental awareness training, it's just that it's being tweaked 
for the purpose on board and what they need to know and the uh, and the specific crew members need to know about science and approach whilst the company and the ship owners mental awareness training may be a little bit more on the corporate level so it's more or less the same purpose of these training sessions for the diff but different targets the same goes with the with the consultations and of, of experts in the maybe in the psychological field yeah um also good to mention the leadership coaching uh, it's also nothing new it's been around for a very long time and and it's uh, maybe a continuation in this sense to what comes out from the psychological assessments which more and more uh, emphasizes the leadership and and the people skills the people management skills and if there are some question marks that are being recognized that in in the leadership it could be addressed and put together with a coach or a mentor to to improve those aspects all in the name of trying to uh, better understand uh, you know the the emotional component in in the team and in the crew in the crew members in order to mitigate uh, uh, you know health issues yeah no that makes perfect sense thank you for that um we've had another com i'm conscious of time um but yeah. we've had a question come in for you um Raising awareness is based on emotional involvement and feelings of compassion. Do you think this is even possible in a maritime masculine environment? And how do you see women seafarers affected in this masculine environment? This is a very, very good question. And it's also a very complex one. It's not easily solved. This is about culture, culture that goes back for a very long time. And we know that changing values and changing culture takes a very very long time as well uh, but it's of course it's doable we can just look at other industries uh, which is let's say male dominated uh, also been able to turn the tide let's say a little bit and to implement an, an importance and the emphasis on on uh, uh, emotional components in work as well so of course it's doable but yeah it's a challenge and once again this is something that will have the greatest impact when working from top to bottom uh, having the industry uh, collaborating more closely with this rather than trying to target specific ships or specific individuals it will have no effect but culture we need to work from 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 the top no thank you for that um i i think that that is a that question is quite a broad topic and we could probably have a webinar just i want an entire conversation just on that particular topic but as you Indeed. say from a cultural perspective it, it certainly does have to come from the top down um, and there's a lot of work the industry has done around this, but as with all these things, there's so much more that can be done. Um, there's one more quick question for you, Martin, that's come in. Um, given that the maritime uh, industry leads to high pressure situations, how do you, how do you um, suggest that seafarers can exercise mindfulness, which I think is a fantastic question um, for the maritime industry um, and, and especially on board a vessel? Well, uh, mindfulness uh, as a method is is fairly easy to actually apply. You don't need any you know specific tools, or any any you know any specific things around you, any equipment or so. So you can do it anywhere, anytime. Um, of course, on board the ships, uh, what what could constitute as something that would ease it would have a, a good technical platform uh, and the availability of program applications and so forth to to uh, to support this. Of course, and I think maybe. That's one of the areas that Mark would touch on, but uh, in general, I think it's a it's a it's a great tool uh, because it's so simple to use, and uh, it's that is also more of a stigma to work with and to make sure that this is not just something strange out of yoga stuff, but it's actually something that has proven to be very effective in terms of mental well being. Yeah, no, I would agree. I think any form of meditation from a mindfulness perspective. Um, and massive benefits and as you say there's maybe some work to be done around the stigma attached to that especially in a very masculine environment so it sounds like um commitment seems to be a challenge an ongoing challenge uh, within the industry in terms of implementing various different resources and tools and resources to help um improve crew welfare and mental well-being it also sounds like um perhaps as an education piece around the resources, the free resources that are currently available, a lot of businesses may not be aware that they can easily and simply implement these. Um, but it's also clear um, that a proactive top-down approach is required and vital if we're to see a reduction um, in, in suicides and, and mental health uh, cases at sea. Um, cost 
sadly does seem to be a, fa a deciding factor, which is a very st sad state of affairs, especially when you consider the wider benefits that the workforce um, can glean from, from the various different uh, support mechanisms out there. Um, and also, more importantly, the business from an operational perspective, because as we all know, a happy workforce is a productive workforce. Um, so there certainly, um, certainly gives us a lot of food for thought on top of that top-down approach um, and, and the investment and the commitment to the investment, be that from a time or, or, or a financial. Mark, we've talked a lot about tech technology and connectivity being important. And Martin just met, mentioned there about various different platforms that provide um, services and solutions uh, for training. Um, I mean, you've obviously, I know that MRSAT have been heavily involved in various different crew welfare initiatives, and more recently, the publication of the Welfare, welfare 2.0 report. In the report, it mentions the importance that technology plays in bridging the gap. And if you look at the stats, I mean, some of the, the stats were quite horrific. 28% of seafarers showed symptoms of severe depression and anxiety. So it clearly shows there's a, a genuine need for, for more investment from a technological perspective. What other connectivity usage trends have you seen during COVID? And how does this relate to crew welfare over the longer term? Um, great, Thank, thanks for that, Lisa. Thanks for that question. So um, yeah, I mean, and just to, just to give you a little bit of background around the report, um, this, is, this report has kind of stemmed from a uh, many years of working with the maritime charities and uh, which all of which um, obviously Caitlin mentioned earlier and we worked very closely with ice one as well uh, last year we held a whole, um, a whole day around kind of mental health and crew welfare um, and actually the report itself came um, we started talking about it at the end of last year um, but the factors around it, and obviously since then, you, we've seen with COVID that, you know, has really exposed the welfare of seafarers, uh, you know, to global scrutiny. Um, but we really kind of felt that there was a, you know, there was a, there was a gap around crew welfare and technology. And so we kind of put this together, together to better understand the link between mental health, physical health, stress, yeah. errors, safety on board, and, and, and the preservation of assets as well. Um, what we've seen in terms of the trends that we've seen in terms of COVID COVID nineteen, obviously we've seen um, an increase in 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 data usage from seafarers. Um, it's been up by thirty percent across all vessels across all vessels um, using our high speed internet um, connectivity platform. We've seen a real increase in voice calls as well. We've done a lot again working with the charities and working with ship owners and ship managers. We've seen a real kind of um, increase in the number of voice calls you know some people actually said oh well voice you know it's all now done through whatsapp and social media but there's been a real trend um for voice calling um and in terms of you know just hearing um someone on the line a loved one on the line i know when i was at sea it was always reassuring particularly when you're going through spells of loneliness and is isolation to kind of just talk to somebody uh from a, a loved one um and and hear their voice um, so we are seeing real trends in terms of uh, voice use, usage in a real uptick. What we've also seen is an increase in applications, um, you know, and that's across the board, whether it's, um, you know, the use of Zoom, you know, platforms like we're using right here, right now, you know, the kind of video conferencing facilities, remote monitoring, um, you know, as well. But yep. telemedicine, telemedicine applications, you know, and we've worked together with uh, together with um, Frontem, Vican to provide a telemedicine application, a free free of charge telemedicine application to any of our um, Fleet Express uh, users, and we've seen a real uptake in that. Um, and the ability to kind of have that consultation, you know, twenty four seven ability to kind of tap into that. So there, I think you'll see a kind of an acceleration, not just in the operational side, but in the crew side as well. Um, one of the things the report actually uh, highlighted was, and and you've mentioned it, you know, we've mentioned the kind of the Headspace apps, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I don't know if uh, people know, but you know, the well being um kind of uh sector itself is worth you know over 40 billion um you know in shipping in the last 10 years less than 2 million was spent on crew welfare and crew well-being technology and compare that to things like vessel performance 
um, where there's lots of, you know, you're seeing lots of startups, lots of money being invested, you know, outside investors coming in. There's been a real dearth of investment um, in crew well-being. And that's something that, you know, the report definitely highlighted. And that's something that needs to be addressed because I think it comes back to that kind of, you know, what Martin has said as well. It's around knowledge. It's understanding, you know, what are the human emotions, you know, and and what needs to be in place for them. And I think there is still a kind of a lack of knowledge. You know, people just expect, you know, when I was at sea, this is the way that things were done. And, you know, you shouldn't show your emotions, all of those types of things. But that lack of investment was really highlighted in the report. Um, and we do need to see that and we need to work together in collaboration, you know, not just the companies on this call, but other companies out there and also with ship management um, companies, ship operators, etc. You know, we do need to come together and we need to kind of start working on this more holistic approach to crew welfare. No, I would agree that there definitely is a the, the, it's time for the industry to come together, um, not just the companies on this call today, but also the entire industry to take a much more holistic approach, especially when you consider um, the, the levels of investment that have been made. Um, it's quite shocking. Um, Mark, in your opinion, why do you believe there has been such a lack of uh, funding for technology um, in terms of crew welfare? I think it's hard, hard hard to measure the impact of, you know, the kind of the impact, the social impact on a seafarer, you know, kind of having availability and kind of having a care package. Um, yeah. it, it's much easier from an operational perspective to say, well, if I use this piece of software, you know, this application, then I'm going to save X amount of my total operating costs. You know, it's a lot harder to say, well, if I give this for my crew, it means I'm going to retain my crew. Those crew are going to be happy, you know, a happy crew, happy ship, high morale, those types of things. That is hard to measure. Now, some ship operators are obviously doing that and realize that, um, but it is hard to measure. I think the other point to make, Lisa, is that, you know, there is a real link. And again, the report highlighted that, you know, sea, seafarers, um, who are depressed or suffering from anxiety are twice as likely to get injured or suffer from another illness while on board compared to those who are not. And of course, then that puts that brings safety into play. And there's not just, you know, the safety of the seafarers, the safety of the vessel as well. So that is it's a kind of a real correlation between that as well, between seafarer well-being and safety. And Again, you are seeing companies, companies like Shell, who are kind of bringing in there and working with um, application providers like Hilo, you know, and around their kind of safety and risk management piece. So there is that connection is starting to happen, but it's not happening quick enough. It's interesting you should raise that because health and safety at sea and from an insurance perspective, the number of cases, I mean, insurance companies, I know that there's quite a lot that a lot of um, claims are based on because of uh, vessel collisions, et cetera, at sea. Um, some of that could be down to the human element. Um, so, yeah, I think it would be good to, to maybe we need to take a closer look at um, how companies better when they are doing their budgets, maybe crew welfare from a technological perspective needs to be factored in from that health and safety budget, because then that might help to reduce um, the number of cases of collisions, etc. cetera, at sea. So, um, and they'll make more of an investment um, because it, it seems to me that crew, whilst crew welfare is now becoming more prevalent and more important, it does sound to me that there's just not enough of a impetus uh, within the bigger org some of the organisations, they just don't see the true value because they don't get that tangible immediate return on their investment. So yeah, thank you for that, Mark. Um, definitely a lot of food for thought there. Um, it's great to hear that the industry is taking small steps, but once again, we need to see more investment um, and more work done in terms of adopting the technologies that are available. Um, so thank you for that. Peter, now that we've got a better understanding of the role of technology plays in enabling solution providers to deliver frontline care to seafarers when they need it most, it would be really good if we could now maybe touch upon um, the MAP programme that you mentioned earlier um, and to better understand why VICAN formed that programme. Was it based on seafarer suggestions or advice from uh, medical professionals or both? Honestly, we, we saw the need in the industry and we were exposed to the issues of mental wellness issues constantly. But I think it's also a combination of the healthcare vis-a-vis -vis mental health as well. But let yeah. me just start with by saying that one of the most extraordinary things that we are going through right now is the uh, technology evolution that um, Inmarsat has 
offer the maritime industry, which, which offers us an opportunity to engage with our seafarers in a much more convenient way, in a less expensive way as well. And then uh, back to front end, providing a great front, um, front, uh, um, front end connection uh, makes the experience really well. So I think right now technology has caught up with remote healthcare. And I think that's really uh, a moment in time when we can really provide the, the support to the maritime industry in a way that we've never been able to do uh, before. VCAN's uh, Maritime Assistance Program, MAP for short, is really a customized mental wellness program for the maritime industry, where the cruise and the commercial shipping industry, yachting industry, and other aspects of the maritime industry can subscribe to a custom-built uh, mental wellness platform specific for the seafarer's need on board. Uh, MAP offers two defined uh, components, and in many ways, we're kind of wrapping the tools that Martin was talking about before into a one solutions approach, which include the training, the education, uh, and the support uh, to the corporate management and the shipwork management, which includes the crisis management the, uh, and the identification on, of vulnerable crews so we can proactively engage with vulnerable crew. We're also providing the onboard training and mental wellness self-assessment tools for the crew through communication, which is really important Many times the crew themselves with the right tools can do a lot of good for themselves. In yeah. this program, we also have a care component. Um, a lot of us in the maritime industry, we, we may be exposed to a crew member, to a friend who normally is outgoing and, and having lunch with you every day. And suddenly this person gets withdrawn and doesn't engage as much anymore. And you may become a little concerned. We offer a, an outlet and an opportunity for those people that are concerned to connect with us, and we can then reach out to this individual crew member to have a conversation. Um, we also have a 24 seven mental wellness hotline for all of the crew um, and a separate hotline for the captains who generally are very, are in a very challenging position. They're lonely, they don't have anyone to talk to. Uh, so we're providing that outlet for the captains. And again, I'm coming back to the questions around confidentiality there is 100% confidentiality. This is not an extension of the corporation. This is something the corporation is offering the crew, but there is no connectivity in terms of sharing data at all. Our MAP program is also available to crew members when they're back home um, as an additional um, support. An important, a really important component of this MAP program is the evaluation between the physiological and the mental wellness issue. It cannot be stated strongly enough. Um, with certain chronic diseases, such as diabetes or high blood pressure, you may actually end up almost being in a mental stress state if your sugar is out of control, if your high blood pressure is out of control. Yep. So what we're offering is a combination of the, the medical and healthcare and physiological and the mental wellness side, and we're able to analyze that very quickly. So if somebody's having their sugar out of control and if somebody on this call have diabetes or know of somebody with diabetes, you know that they can get a little crazy if they're not controlling their sugar. So it's very important that when we do the diagnosis and we're providing the support, we understand the physiological side as well as the neurology side. It's a very important component. No, I, absolutely. I, c I can only imagine. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, the Maritime Assistance Programme certainly sounds like it would be very beneficial to a number of different um, shipping organisations out there. Um, just one last question for you, and I'm very conscious of time because we we, we've got some resources we want to share with the audience next. Um, from a technological perspective, how does uh, VICAN plan to leverage Frontem and Inmarsat's technology to expand its current healthcare efforts in the future? Well, we have created a total healthcare solutions platform within Marsat and, and uh, Frontem that is very easy to access through an app provided by Frontem with both the healthcare and the mental wellness support services all bundled into one in a total healthcare approach that takes care of the totality of the healthcare needs of a vessel operator. So the vessel operator can step away. They don't have to get engaged in the healthcare side or the mental wellness side there is a separate third party uh, vendor that provides all of that in a very easy and affordable and easy to implement approach in a way that has never been done before where you're just using your iPhone and an application. It is quite frankly, quite remarkable 
how technology has been able to catch up with the service solutions that we need to provide the maritime industry. That's brilliant. Thank you so much for that. Um, so yeah, so that's great to hear that MyCant is embracing technology um, and that's certainly becoming extremely disruptive from a healthcare perspective um, in delivering um, these applications into the seafarers um, and the businesses so they can access the help that they need when they need it, regardless of location. Um, now, today, um, audience, we've heard from a panel of leading experts um, who have discussed the top three strategies to improve crew well-being and mental health during and beyond the pandemic. We focused on the importance of that technology and connectivity plays in bringing seafarers closer together um, with the support that they need most when they need it. We've also taken a deep dive into the free tools, resources and support frameworks that are immediately available to help you to start identifying and supporting those at risk. We understand that not all businesses work um, work the same. They can be work, operate very differently, which is why we wanted to provide you with a range of free tools today and resources that can be easily deployed to seafarers. And the only investment required on your part would be time and commitment. Now, on the slide here, you'll see a list of different resources. We will be emailing these out to you, along with a short survey and any answers to any questions that we didn't manage to get to today. We've heard about the importance of awareness um, and taking a top-down approach across the maritime industry in terms of being able to address the immediate needs um, and look to, 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 to change the current status quo. Um, however, we understand that leadership teams live in a time-poor world um, and it can be challenging to, 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 to find the time sometimes to, to deploy the resources. But all it will take is a small a small amount of time to send out emails, to get things printed off, to put them on the notice boards, um, and to deploy some of the free applications that are widely available that can help to, to improve crew welfare. Um, so we, we at the panel today would like to ask industry leaders to come together um, and, 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 and to, 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 to think about potentially looking at how we can implement these three tools. Um, and, 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 and then maybe again in three months time, we'll carry out um, a further review to see if any of the statistics are starting to come down. Um, we, we're looking upon you, the leadership teams, um, to, to, to take the industry forward. Um, we can't leave seafarers in limbo anymore. There's resources out there available today, and we're asking you to make that commitment to take them back to your captains, to your HR teams, and deploy them to your seafarers. Um, we'll be hosting a quarterly webinar, as I've mentioned, to review the progress and to further explore ways in which industry can unite to improve the quality of life for our global seafaring community. We'll also be looking at potentially putting together some form of um, charter, um, best practice charter, um, and we'll talk more about that in our next in our next webinar. I'd like to thank everyone today who have joined. Um, we hope that you found the session beneficial. Um, and we really do hope that you take these resources back to your business and start to implement them today. If we can save one seafarer's life today, then this session's been very much uh, worthwhile um, and, and worth your time. Once again, we'll be sending out an email with all the resources, um, a short survey, um, and answers to any outstanding questions. Thank you, panel, for your time today, um, and thank you, audience. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Take care for now. Thank you. Bye-bye.